for the chairperson Dr. Ram Manohar, who is a member of Central Council of Indian Medicine, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, and uh, he is also the member of Research Advisor Committee, National Commission for History of Science, Indian National Science Academy, Government of India. He is Associate Editor of International Journal of Ayurveda Research, Department of Ayush, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. He is a member of Editorial Board, Indian Journal for History of Science, Indian National Science Academy, Government of India. He is a member of Subcommittee uh, for Public Relations, uh, Scientific Communication and IEC for International Cooperation, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. He is a member Secretary of National Task Force for Rudra Program, Department of Ayush, Government of India. The Chief Editor, Journal of Clinical uh, Rheumatology in Ayurveda. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be present before you uh, chairing this session and also speaking for a little while about my experiences in the field of international collaborative research. The organizers have asked me to share my experiences in actually implementing an international collaborative research. So we did uh, an interesting study with funding from the National Institutes of Health USA which we think is the first of its kind uh, collaboration that has happened in the field of Ayurveda with the involvement of some leading universities in the United States like the University of California, Los Angeles and the University of Washington, Seattle. So our studies have now been concluded and uh, we are happy to announce that uh, some of the papers are already got published or in the process of publication, they've been accepted for publication. So, and the results of the study is also very interesting. But what I will be talking about here today is not necessarily too much of details about the study, but what it means to, you know, involve in an international collaboration. Now, what is the need for international collaboration in research? I think that's the first question I would like to address. I mean, can't we do research in India? Each country do it in their own, you know, uh, closed manner. But if you look at the international scenario, I mean, collaborative research is becoming the way. I mean, there's a lot of importance given to, you know, uh, international collaboration. And India also figures as one of the most prominent destinations for collaborative reasons, most often for the wrong reasons, you know, because it's very inexpensive to do clinical trials in India. It's easier to get poor people recruited for clinical trials but we are already on the international research scenario. So this is becoming, as is uh, mentioned in this extract, an important aspect of research activity globally. So uh, apart from the wrong reasons, the good reasons, the nice reasons for international collaboration are that it helps you know, the best experts and the best resources in the field to come together. I mean, it's very difficult for you to have everything in one place. And when you have it in multiple you know, locations, you make sure that the best experts in the field has come together. And this adds tremendous value to your research activity. Because you know, when you start a research activity, it's the end result that is most important. Can you tell me what is the end result that you think? What should a research activity culminate in? Can anybody suggest? Yeah? Right. Yes. I'm, this is from a commercial point of view, yes. From a research point of view, a research question being answered. I'd like to use a different terminology, is that it should impact the field. You know, it should contribute to existing knowledge. And as a result, we might have new products, new methodologies but the the bottom line is that it should create an impact in the field you know so many I, I expected an answer that many people today think you must from a research point of view end up in a publication but that's not enough I mean publication is only the beginning of actually what happens after you complete a research so you know your research should impact the field your research should become utilized at both the academic level at the clinical level and as well as at the practical level and if you have an international collaboration with the best experts and the best resources in the field,
the chances of this happening is extremely high. So, uh, and things can happen much faster when you have a international collaboration. You know, the timelines for getting a paper published or accepted for publication and post-publication developments, all these happen in a much faster way if you ha have an international collaborative network. So when we look at an international collaboration, there are certain key issues that we need to consider. One is you must be having very clear objectives. Uh, international collaboration is not for the sake of international collaboration. Okay. So uh, when you have an international collaboration, you must be very clear that that collaboration is going to fulfill certain objectives and that these objectives cannot be fulfilled in any other way. Then it's worth the trouble. You must look at benefits and risks also. I mean, there are benefits as well as risks. I will come to that. And then the success of an international collaboration very much depends on which partners you select you know, for the collaboration. There are funding mechanisms which are very important. If you get funding from a certain prestigious agency, that itself creates you know, a huge credibility for your work. Then there are modalities that we need to discuss. I will discuss a little more details. And then there is the implementation and the outcome. We need to consider all these aspects when we think of an international collaboration. So I'd like to share my experiences on these aspects you know, of international collaboration. This was the study. Our institute was the Ayurvedic Trust. I already mentioned we had two universities in the US and funding from the National Institutes of Health, USA. Our goal was to conduct a randomized controlled clinical trial comparing whole Ayurveda intervention for rheumatoid arthritis against standard allopathic medication. Now, see, why we thought international was we had this objective in mind. We wanted to showcase Ayurveda as a complete system of medicine. You know, today when Ayurveda is getting globalized, you know, the entry route that is available for us is mostly product based. You know, you can introduce one product of Ayurveda maybe into a Western country, but still Ayurveda is not accepted as a medical system. Because we would call this as, you know, preserving the holism of Ayurveda as well as the rigor of science. You know, we needed to have a dialogue. It's not simply saying that, you know, we decide whatever we want, you have to accept, or you decide whatever they want and we have to accept. It was, you know, a, a dialogue with mutual respect. And then there can be understanding. So we said that we are willing to follow any protocol that you advocate because you have the doubts. But as long as it does not interfere with our way of diagnosing and treating patients. So we even went to the extent of accepting placebos. This was one thing, one compromise which we did from our, it was not a compromise, an adjustment that we did from our side. And on the other hand, they agreed to include 90 medications in the treatment protocol. And we were given the freedom to you know, choose whichever medication we required depending on the individual condition of the patient. So now, the benefits projecting Ayurveda as a complete and independent system of healing, generating the highest level of evidence. So we wanted to prove that Ayurveda could be studied using the highest level of evidence, randomized clinical trial, without affecting the approach of Ayurveda. We planned for a publication in high impact journals and I'm happy to tell you that our paper, this is a rheumatology study, our first publication was accepted in the Annals of the Rheumatic Disease which with an impact factor of 8.111. It's the number one rheumatology journal in the world. So, you know, this should be our target. I mean, there should be, our goal should be the highest, you know, the peak of what is possible. And it was successful. We could do it. We had to wait. There was a two year wait after the study before the first paper got published. But I think this is also very fast, considering the fact that we are introducing something new into the medical community. And I would also like to say with a lot of satisfaction that this is the first report on Ayurveda in the ARD. You know, it's not a small thing. And the ARD is very influential in the rheumatology field. And our outcomes was also discussed as a presentation in the annual meeting of the American College of Rheumatology. And this is again the first time that you know a study on Ayurveda is getting discussed in such an international forum. And we are hoping and the full paper has now been accepted for publication in the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology, which is again a very influential journal of the Pan-LAR, Pan-American League of you know, Rheumatologists. 
So there were other benefits like exposure to international research standards, capacity building, cost effectiveness. But there are also risks because we had to struggle a lot to get this project cleared from the Indian government. When the NIH was willing to give us crores of rupees to do a study, our government said no. Because you know, we wanted to be sure that there would not be any you know, misappropriation of knowledge in this process of research. So we still remember with great difficulty we had to ensure, we had to get assurances from the you know, US universities and from the NIH that any outcomes of the study would not be misappropriated. I mean, we had to ensure that. This is one very sensitive area when we engage. And this is one of the reasons we also told them that don't expect to get any single drug or molecule out of the study. If that is your interest, we are not going with you. The, the goal is to accept Ayurveda as a complete system. And now, even, even after the study is over, what we have proven is that you need an Ayurvedic physician in the US to actually treat the disease, not an Ayurvedic drug. And I think there's a big difference between the two. So, you know, there's also a big risk involved. If your study protocol is not designed properly, I will come to that, a negative impact at such a, uh, you know, global platform can destroy. In fact, this was a big tension for us till the analysis was done. If it was proven, and we, we were very close to coming out with a negative study. You know, I will tell you how. It's very important when we design a study that, you know, you need to do a lot of preparatory work. Now we need trained personnel, clearance. These are all some of the risks. You know, when you identify a partner, you have to look at very different things. You must make sure that they have the right domain expertise. They have mutually, you know, credibility. I mean, they should be satisfied with your credibility and you must also be happy with them and this is not so easy you need a lot of exchanges before this can happen and uh, you know you need to identify areas of common interest it would be advisable to have an mou always you know because then the terms and conditions are very clear when you look at international collaboration we found that many universities would they were also very conscious about who is funding the project. I mean, they were not willing to participate if the funding came from, you know, not so important agencies. And we approached the NIS, the National Institutes of Health, which is the apex research body in the US. And we realized that there's a lot of effort needed in this direction. You know, grant writing itself is a, is a great skill. I mean, the NIH offers, uh, you know, opportunities for training in grant writing. They, they uh, empower the you know potential grantees and then enable them to get the research project so what was most important here is this approach was always quality conscious i mean you're willing to give a grant but then the grantee organization itself ensures that the grant is of a very high quality and they're willing to help you with writing a grant but there's no compromise when it comes to sanctioning a grant and this was a very interesting experience now, there are other issues like writing the research protocol, you know, identifying, developing the most appropriate methodologies, training personnel, site visits, study monitoring, developing case report forms, data entry modules. These are all very complex things. There is no time to get into all those details. But when it comes to, you know, developing research protocols, we had a lot of debates. And I would like to share my experience. We wanted to do a pure Ayurvedic study, evaluate Ayurveda Ayurvedically. You know, rheumatoid not rheumatoid arthritis, Amavata or Vata Rekta, whatever it is. Evaluate outcomes using our. And here we realized a big lacuna that we have. We don't have validated instruments or tools, you know, to be able to objectively show how 10 physicians in the field of Ayurveda can arrive consistently at one diagnosis. So, but they were very uh, cooperative. So they said that you take this as a future goal. At this point of time, we will diagnose according to ACR criteria because that we have tools. But you will be given the freedom to diagnose each patient according to your parameters and give whatever medicines you want. You know, so a lot of discussions and dialogues happened. There were issues whether we can develop placebos. And for the first time, we developed placebos for Ayurveda, Kashayams, Arishtams. So we worked around, we had one placebo Kashayam. So whichever Kashayam is given, we needed to give only one placebo kashayam. So that way we, so we call these as generic placebos. And then when it comes to implementation, again, there are issues like IRB, 
Uh, no, I'm just trying to tell you what are the issues that you will encounter. Because in its 20 minutes, I think I'm already approaching my uh, conclusion. But uh, it's not possible to elaborately discuss everything. IRB approvals are very, very important at international level. You know, any violation, because once we made a minor violation and one of the research investigators gently told me, look, Dr. Manohar, if you were in the US, you would be behind the bars already. He was, of course, slightly exaggerating, but he wanted to tell me that, you know, the ethical issues, which even India has now become very much sensitized, but they are very often neglected in our research, like getting a consent from a patient. I mean, there's absolutely no compromise. You have to clearly tell and record that you have really explained to the patient what they are going to undergo, and you get a consent form. There were issues like, you know, uh, the IRB approvals, we had three groups, I will come to that. One group received only Ayurveda, the other group received only allopathy, and the third group received a combination of Ayurveda and allopathy. And the groups which received only Ayurveda got the placebo of allopathic medicine, and the group which received allopathy got the placebo of Ayurveda. So there was a big objection. How can you have a group, you know, in which you give only Ayurveda because according to a USA IRB, this was not acceptable. It meant denying treat, pay, treatment to a patient. So there are so many cross-cultural issues which we had to work around. So there are issues like compliance with protocols. You have to subject yourself to study, monitoring, blinding procedures, and things like that. So uh, the outcomes are also quite challenging. There's a lot of data cleaning that needs to be done. We need to uh, you know, facilitate with statisticians. There were issues like we never allowed the actual data to go into the United States. You know, there were figures that were transferred, but not the complete data. So there are a lot of mechanisms that we need to make sure that the data is protected, the privacy of the subjects are protected, and this calls for security implementation at various levels. And finally, as I said, you know, publication and all this happened. Now I'd like to say a few things about what happened in the study, because that's the most interesting part. So we had a 36-week study. See, this was very crucial. We could have had a negative result because initially the proposal was to have six months treatment, 24 weeks. We had done some preliminary studies earlier which showed us that the maximum response would happen between six months and nine months. So we refused to comply with a six-week duration study. And you can see from the results later, this made a very big difference between success and failure. If we had stuck to the six month study, the result would have been negative. And today we would have been instrumental in declaring to the world that Ayurveda has nothing to offer in rheumatoid arthritis. And we're really glad that our planning was really, you know, proper. So we had 45 subjects. It's a pilot study. It was a double blind study. So we had decoctions, medicated wines, medicated ghee, all the entire spectrum. The physician had the freedom to choose whatever he wanted. You know, this is the first time that in an international clinical trial, you have the physician changing medications at every visit. You know, we said we need to see the patients every two weeks. They said we can see it only three times during the entire study. But in order to comply with our requirement, the allopathic physician was also forced to see the patients every 15 days. This is to avoid what is called as a Hawthorne effect, so that the patients should always get the feeling that they're getting the same treatment. You know, otherwise there would be a bias. So a lot of methodological adjustments were made. Six generic placebos were developed. Now the measurements are ACR criteria for diagnosis and evaluation. We looked at outcomes. What was the improvement? 20%, 50%, 70%, Q quality of life measures like health assessment questionnaire, short form 36, all these were used. And we also did independent, you know, Ayurveda diagnosis. Now one interesting thing is many of these international questionnaires, we need to translate into Indian languages and then back translate. This validation can take a lot of time. So when you are involving in an international trial, it would be good to anticipate such issues and prepare for them. Now I am coming to the conclusion of my talk. The outcomes of the study. Put it plainly, Ayurveda and Methotrexate were approximately equivalent in efficacy at end of nine months. But the Ayurvedic group had the least side effects. 
Now, this was something which no rheumatologist had ever imagined could exist, that there is an alternative for methotrexate. You know, according to us, rheumatoid arthritis needs even more long-term treatment. So if we had done a still long-term study, probably our treatment would have shown that it is much superior, because I'll show you it already showed those tendencies. But the combination of Ayurveda and methotrexate was the worst. This group had the maximum number of side effects. And the reasons could be that in clinical practice, we can adjust the dosage, but in a clinical trial, we could not. So that is probably the reason why this happened. Now you can see here the success of blinding. One of the major outcomes of the study is that we found that we could fool our patients into thinking that they were taking kashayams when they were actually taking colored liquids. This is important for Ayurveda because I don't believe that RCTs are the way for Ayurveda in the future. But a few RCT studies like this can actually break the ice and make these modern scientists, you know, think in a different way. This is not feasible. It's very expensive. But we need to show the proof of concept that Ayurveda is also a science and that we can produce evidence. If you do, there's another approach possible. We say we can give you only another kind of evidence. And then they will say it's always inferior evidence. But here, we are able to do two things. That we say that, you know, you cannot now say that the evidence is inferior. And you, can, you have to also accept that this is working. And then, you know, we can say that uh, the other things might also work. And now, this is the most important slide. You can see study week 24 on the extreme left is 20% improvement. At the end of study week 24, Maximum red is Ayurveda, blue is, uh, you know, uh, uh, methotrexate, and the gray one is the combination. So you can see Ayurveda had maximum response for 20% at week 24. Less, 50% response was more in methotrexate group, and 70% response was highest in methotrexate group. At week 24, we, we found that Ayurveda could not produce more than 20% improvement. And this would have been the conclusion of the study had the duration been fixed at six months. But because we extended it up to week 36, the picture turned completely upside down. At week 36, you can find here that the maximum number of response for 70% improvement is in the Ayurvedic group. And so we were able to show that as the treatment progresses, you know, the Ayurvedic response improves. And maybe if we go to 12 months and 15 months, less side effects, more sustainability, Ayurvedic treatment might be the answer for rheumatoid arthritis. So this is what, this is the uh, extract from the annals of the rheumatic disease, well-controlled, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials of classical Ayurvedic treatment are possible in rheumatoid arthritis. And this is an extract of the paper that appeared in this journal. We have three, three you know, exposures now. A, new, a full paper is coming in the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology. And I'm also happy to point out that many other journals in the West are beginning to quote this study as a model study, you know, for further research. So I think there is a lot of potential in promoting international research. And I think we should not always wait for funding from outside. It's worth the trouble. The Indian government should also invest some money in international research. I would like a joint advisor to kind of consider this because you know it's very important that this crucial point of time that we showcase at least a few studies at such high quality that you know it will change the way Ayurveda is perceived globally. Thank you very much for your attention.